the Natural Capital Committee's conference. Uh, this is a uh, celebration. Uh, it's an ending and it's the beginning of the delivery of hopefully a much greener and uh, more prosperous land. The Natural Capital Committee was formed uh, back in 2012. We've had two terms of office and we've now uh, completed uh, both of those uh, uh, terms and uh, we will be passing on the baton to the new Office for Environmental Protection uh, and uh, the new framework for the 25-year plan and for uh, the Environment Bill and the statutory targets going forward. So this is an exciting moment and the purpose of today is to uh, go through uh, what we've done uh, convey to you the main messages and the main recommendations we've made, uh, the methodology, the research, the science, the economics, the accounting, which has been part and parcel of our work over the last uh, eight years. Before I uh, go through uh, the programme and the panel members and move on to make some opening remarks, let me make a couple of admin uh, uh, points. First of all, if you have any technical problems, just go to the get in touch section of the website and there's a whole support team uh, much more capable than me of handling the kind of technical issues that could but hopefully won't uh, uh, happen during the course of the day. You should also know that the conference is being recorded. So if you want to come back to what we've covered during the course of the day uh, or pass it on to others, that will be available on uh, our website for the next, I think, 12 months. So hopefully that's going to be a very useful resource. So today we have brought uh, the work of the Natural Capital Committee towards its conclusion. And we have two reports uh, which we brought out uh, in the last few days. Uh, and one of those uh, today. We have done our assessment, the, the, the second assessment of how well the government's doing on the 25 year plan and meeting the overall uh, objective of leaving the natural environment in a better state for the uh, future generations. And we produced a natural capital committee end of term report. Now I happen to think that's really a, a crucial thing to do I'm not a great believer in committees in perpetuity. Uh, we have clear terms of reference. As we'll explain, we have delivered on those terms of reference. And it's extraordinarily important to bring that work together. So it's not just something helpful that happened, but it's there as a legacy and a useful frame for what comes next. And what comes next will be absolutely crucial uh, to the environment, to our natural capital and to our climate. And we hope and we hope to demonstrate during the course of the day that what we have done uh, over the last eight years provides some sound foundations on which everyone can build. And that's the kind of celebration and uh, setting the signposts and the signals going forward that we're going to go through during the course of the day. Now, um, we should first uh, do what we do if this was, a, of course, a physical conference uh, and introduce uh, the members of the Natural Capital Committee. And we've had two uh, um, uh, terms of office, and two sets of members. This is the current uh, committee and uh, uh, which I have the privilege of, of chairing. The Natural Capital Committee has managed in eight years never to have anything other than uh, uh, unanimous signing of all documents and all reports we've uh, uh, delivered. And it's been uh, the result of the extraordinary work of everyone who's been on this committee over that eight years. I don't know anyone who hasn't done way beyond what was asked of them. Uh, and we've had a set of skills which bring together both economics and science uh, and practical understanding to put our recommendations together. Uh, in our current team, we have Colin Mayer, who's very much our go-to finance person uh, and has been instrumental in developing both our work with the ONS on national natural capital accounting, but also the corporate side 
and making sure that the asset-based approach has a sound economic framework. We've got Cathy Willis, who's going to be talking uh, shortly and leading the science session this afternoon. Uh, Cathy is our core uh, um, person on the metrics, on the methodology, on the baseline, and Cathy is the person who's pushed our ideas for a natural capital baseline about which we'll be hearing a lot more during the day. Paul Leinster has been uh, crucial in what we developed, uh, uh, painstakingly looking at everything we produced. He brings the practical experience of having been a chief executive of the Environment Agency and also a deep understanding of the uh, broader issues uh, of the natural environment and how to make stuff work as well as to make sure it's intellectually robust. Now, in the second uh, term in this current committee, we uh, augmented um, our uh, team with two crucial uh, resources, two crucial people in two crucial areas. And that's Melanie Austin, who brings the marine dimension, which I think we probably neglected in the first term. And um, uh, Melanie uh, from Plymouth, has been able to point to the natural capital of our shorelines, our marine environment, and massively beefed up the work we've done on that front. And Chris Collins has brought the uh, expertise on soils. Um, he's the one who taught me early on that soils have about four times the carbon of the atmosphere. And if I wanted to know about biodiversity, I had to understand what was beneath my feet rather than above. Uh, Collins, uh, Chris has been absolutely crucial to us and last but certainly not least, Ian Bateman, who with uh, Colin and myself have been through both uh, terms of the Natural Capital Committee. Ian is the outstanding environmental economist, uh, uh, not just here, uh, but um, uh, known throughout the world for his expertise. He's been fantastically important in developing the Green Book with the Treasury and making sure that we've been using the latest and best economics. So it's been a fantastic uh, team and um, uh, uh, everything we've done has been a, a function of what the, the team has put in. Now, that's, of course, the, the current team, the previous uh, committee. Um, if we could move to that slide, please. Um, had, um, in addition to Colin uh, and myself and Ian, uh, a, a great set of people. In fact, uh, Diane Cole carried on through to uh, last year um, with the committee. Um, again, I won't go through everyone, uh, but I did want to use the opportunity not only to thank this group, and we'll be hearing from Rosie later on the day, but also I wanted to use this moment to pay tribute to G Georgina Mace. Um, Georgina passed away uh, very recently. It's a tragic loss. Um, she has devoted her life to uh, trying to make a better environment, trying to get people to understand biodiversity. She has a, a long uh, legacy and the red list and uh, understanding uh, endangered species and so on. But for our committee, she was absolutely central in our first term in helping to put together the methodology. And anyone who wants to understand just how deep her work is and how important it is, what was our third annual report seemed a long time ago, Georgina was absolutely central to that. We all miss her. We're all incredibly grateful for the fantastic contribution and it's a tragedy that she's no longer with us to be here today and to be able to take things forward. So um, uh, I can't say enough uh, in praise and in memory of uh, Georgina. And much of today is really a reflection, I hope, of what she would have liked us to go on and do. So that's our committee. I, I must also mention the Secretariat. Um, we have had fabulous support um, uh, from uh, our secretariats right through the eight years. In the early days, we were led by Nick Barter and Julian Harlow, who were outstanding and both uh, very important inside DEFRA, and Nick in particular, leading the development of the 25-year plan and now doing lots of work on the carbon side. But our current committee has been really uh, ably led by Manif. Uh, you can see their photos up there. Um, if anyone ever doubts the quality of the British civil service or how hard people work in DEFRA and in government departments, you just have to look at what this team has done and in particular in producing these last two reports. So that's 
our team and I'm very grateful to them. Let me just quickly uh, take you through the programme and then make a few remarks before we pass on to our first uh, session. Now, the programme is uh, designed to be in three parts. In this part, we're going to hear um, a, a pre-record from Rebecca Powell. Um, we don't have, unfortunately, the Secretary of State with us today, but uh, I think everyone will understand they're extremely pressing things, not least legislation out there. Um, Rebecca's going to set the scene, and then Cathy is going to tell us about natural capital frameworks, absolutely core to uh, our latest set of uh, recommendations in our assessment of performance and core to what we've been doing. And then uh, Tamara Finkelstein, the Permanent Secretary, will conclude this first sec section with some reflections from the department. And that'll give us, take us to the break. And then when we get to the break, uh, after the break, we're going to have three key uh, presentations, all live, from uh, Zach Goldsmith, uh, the Minister of State, uh, from Baroness Brown, who leads on the adaptation side for the Climate Change Committee, and Kemi Badnock uh, from the Treasury, uh, the Economic Secretary. It's absolutely crucial that the Treasury is involved. They're part and parcel of what we've been uh, uh, doing all the way along. And our committee, of course, has reported in the first term to the Economic Subcommittee of the Cabinet, not to the Treasury or to DEFRA directly. And in the second uh, term, we have been reporting to the successor of that economic subcommittee. And so the Natural Capital Committee has been as much at home in DEFRA as it's been in the Treasury. And so it should be, because the objective is to put natural capital at the heart of the economy. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A session, and I'll introduce that at the beginning of the next session to explain uh, how that's going to, to work. So just a couple of words by way of introduction to the day. Uh, the background is, of course, an exciting one. We have the Environment Bill and the Agricultural Bill going through Parliament. The Environment Bill embodies the 25-year plan, sets up the Office for Environmental Protection and sets the springboard, therefore, to deliver on that pledge to leave the natural environment in a better state uh, than this generation inherited it. I have to say it's not going well so far when we look at results on the ground, and that's what our recent uh, report demonstrates in spades. There's a huge amount to do, but what we also demonstrate is what you need to do to make this work. And if the government takes our advice and we're just advisors and implements fully what we have recommended, then there is every prospect of delivering that outcome and the economic prosperity that goes with it. That's a lot of work to be done. And uh, we've had lots of uh, announcements of things that governments are gonna do, actions that are gonna be taken. But so far, these haven't translated into uh, improvements on the ground. And to make those improvements, we've uh, uh, absolutely stressed as far as we possibly can that unless you know what you've got, unless you do an analysis of the baseline of the state of our natural capital assets, you can't realistically uh, determine whether you're making real progress. And really centrally, you can't make progress on working out whether, in fact, you are developing economic prosperity as a result by picking amongst the many things that need to be done, those with the greatest uh, benefits to the environment and to our well-being and therefore to any sustainable measure of economic growth going forward. So um, that is absolutely central to what we've uh, uh, set out. And um, our assessment uh, to date is that uh, although uh, the principles that we've uh, uh, pushed, polluter pays, uh, public money for public goods and net environmental gain have found their way into the lexicon, just as the concept of natural capital has found its way into the public debate, um, these still need to be taken a long way forward. And I should emphasize right at the beginning that the polluter pays principle is radical. Public goods, uh, public money for public goods is radical when it comes to uh, the agricultural bill. And of course, 
if the government were to pursue our advice on net environmental gain rather than the narrower net bio biodiversity gain, that would be, um, uh, I think it's fair to say, a revolution in the way in which we look at our environment and take forward the big agenda in front of us. So um, that's uh, uh, the programme for today. That's what's in front of us. That's the scale of the prize that the government could achieve if it was to follow our advice, do what we uh, suggest should be done and make way to uh, that much greener and more prosperous world. And that's the economic opportunity. And you can say, well, you know, we can take our time. Uh, there's, um, you know, no great hurry. The environment takes time to adjust. But every single day that the government does not advance uh, on this programme is a day wasted in terms of economic opportunity and genuine economic growth. So uh, it's there to be seized. And right now, nobody needs really reminding how important this natural capital is to everybody in our country and thinking more generally uh, outside um, uh, our narrow uh, domains. You know, anyone who's been through the first lockdown has understood what nature means. Anyone going into the second lockdown is going to really appreciate that in uh, autumn and winter rather than in summer. And um, when we look to how economic recovery takes place, and there will be economic recovery, what we have in front of us is a cornucopia of economic opportunities which have um, really high uh, benefits associated with them. And some of the natural infrastructure projects score way above many of the um, uh, everyday but important parts of the physical infrastructure, a point that Ian Bateman has made uh, very forcefully uh, in our history uh, of our works and our reports, but one which is really relevant at the moment. So a great prize in front of us, um, great opportunity. Uh, we now know what needs to be done. We, the NCC, have tried to set out what that comprises and that I hope during the course of the day is going to become more apparent and clearer and provide a legacy which we can uh, hand on to the OEP, to the government in our advice and hopefully see it done so we actually achieve the prize, uh, prize that sits in front of us. So with those introductory remarks, let me move on to the first um, uh, contribution. And this is um, from Rebecca Powell, our uh, uh, minister, and uh, of course, responsible for steering through the Environment Bill uh, uh, through the House of Commons. So uh, Rebecca next, and then we'll move on to Cathy Willis. Hello, everybody who is joining today's Natural Capital Conference. And I'm sorry, obviously, that I can't be with you in person. I'm delighted to participate in today's event hosted by colleagues from the Natural Capital Committee to showcase world leading work on natural capital. And today's virtual conference provides a platform to take stock of what we've achieved, where we are now, and how we move forward into the future. The UK is at the leading edge of natural capital innovation, not least due to the tremendous work of the Natural Capital Committee. Uh, and it's done this over eight years under the leadership, of course, of Dieter Helm. The concept of natural capital has moved from the fringes to the mainstream. It's firmly embedded in government strategy for environmental improvement sitting at the heart of our approach to monitoring and evaluating the 25 year environment plan. And I want to give a really heartfelt thank you to Dieter, to all of the Natural Capital Committee members past and present, and all of those who have uh, contributed to this committee's work throughout the duration of the time that they've been operating. It really has been a tremendous work. So I'm just going to run through some of those achievements. I'm sure you know them all, but I am going to, to run through them because actually a huge uh, amount of work 
has been achieved. Uh, the committee helped shape the government's vision to secure a positive environmental legacy for future generations by laying the groundwork for our landmark 25 year environment plan focused on how we can increase our natural capital. The Natural Capital Committee collaborated with the Treasury and DEFRA in 2018 to introduce a natural capital framework into the Green Book. The Green Book guidance now recognises the importance of stocks of natural capital assessments in the assessment of sustainability and strengthens the valuation of the environmental costs and benefits generated by policy and public spending. The NCC developed advice to government on the concept of a natural capital baseline census in 2019, emphasising that understanding the state of natural capital assets is fundamental for measuring progress against the 25 year plan and other environmental policies. In its final year, the committee created a comprehensive framework for measuring progress against the 25 year plan to hand over to the Office for Environmental Protection, thereby laying the foundation for the OEP to swiftly and effectively undertake its 25 year plan scrutiny function once it's established in 2021. The government will ensure that the NCC's functions are not lost once its term ends on the 30th of November, but are embedded in the new governance arrangements set out in the Environment Bill. And today marks the bill's restart in committee stage after a pause due to the disruption of coronavirus-19. The Environment Bill brings about urgent and meaningful action to combat the environmental and climate crisis we are facing. And it's part of the wider government response to the clear and scientific case and growing public demand for a step change in environmental protection and recovery. The Environment Bill will create a new independent statutory body with the principal objective of contributing to environmental protection and the improvement of the natural environment. The OEP will scrutinise public authorities implementation of environmental law and may provide advice on any proposed changes to environmental law. It will also monitor and report on progress against the environmental improvement plans and targets. The OEP will be able to receive and investigate complaints on alleged serious breaches of environmental law by public authorities. It will also be able to take legal action in serious cases if necessary as a last resort. During its tenure, the NCC has provided advice on the design of the target setting legal framework in the Environment Bill as well, the process by which robust, credible targets are to be developed and the scope of targets that should be set. In August, we set out a roadmap of our programme of work with experts, stakeholders, the public and parliament to develop our evidence. This policy paper helped to address several of the NCC's recommendations. Now, finally, I want to finish on a more personal note in paying tribute to Dame Georgina Mace, who very sadly died in September. Georgina was one of this country's top ecologists and a member of the NCC at its inception. She played a huge part in shaping the 25 year plan, its robust goals framework and played a critical role in many other areas of DEFRA's work over many years. I know that all of you will join with me in recognising her tremendous contribution. We're very grateful for uh, Rebecca's uh, contribution to our conference today and wish her well taking the Environment Bill through uh, the committee stage uh, and uh, thereon uh, uh, through to uh, the framework uh, next year and the targets in 222 and of course the driving through the OEP. We've given uh, very clear advice uh, repeatedly on first of all, the need for a 25 year plan, 
I have to say that was our idea and uh, we gave clear advice on what should be in it um, uh, when Michael Gove uh, took it forward uh, and we've given very clear advice about what we think the OEP should and should not be. Uh, again, we advise governments, ministers decide. Um, so that that's the uh, uh, ministerial frame going forward. We're now going to move to uh, Cathy uh, to talk about um, the natural capital frameworks. J just let me say a few words of introduction um, uh, to this session and um, uh, also to this afternoon session. So Cathy's going to lead this off. Absolutely crucial to what we've done and crucial to the discussion through the day. And after lunch, we have a science symposium, which, um, although I'll introduce, Cathy's going to lead. And that's where we're going to hear from um, uh, uh, Melanie and um, Chris uh, and also uh, Josephine Head from, from Earthwatch. And we're going to have a discussion and questions then. For this session that, that Cathy's uh, leading off now, uh, we will take the questions for that in the Q&A, which we've got half an hour of just before lunch, um, after we've also heard from Zach Goldsmith and Baroness Brown uh, and, and Kemi Bab Babnock. So keep your questions coming, uh, particularly in respect of uh, Cathy's presentation, because I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and we will be coming back to them before lunch. And there's a Q&A at the end of the Science Symposium this afternoon as well. So um, that's the frame for this afternoon. As I say, Cathy has been absolutely instrumental in taking this framework forward. And, you know, I talked about um, what we're very proud of, you know, providing, uh, proposing the 25 year plan, saying what should be going in it, etc. But this stuff is only going to stick. It's only really going to work if we use the technology available to us uh, if we really use the science available to us, if we sort out the metrics, if we measure what we've got. And I think that alongside uh, taking the idea of the 25 year plan, I think and, uh, in the embedding it through the accounts, through this science and through the green book, et cetera, are some of the things I'm most proud of of what we've achieved. So over to Cathy to uh, uh, kick us off and provide uh, that uh, framework, which I hope will be um, also um, the broader context in which we will uh, pursue the discussions through the day. So, Cathy, over to you. Thank you very much, Sita. Right, I guess a slide up. First of all, while I'm waiting for the slide, just to say it's been an absolute honour and privilege to be part of this Natural Capital Committee. And I do believe that there's huge potential for the UK environment going forwards. And I certainly am an optimist about the future um, and also about how the OEP can take forward so many of the ideas that come through from this and from many other government departments to really make the environment a better place in the next 25 years. So I'm speaking now on behalf, I hope this is going to work. Mm -hmm. Let's refresh this. <laughs> right, this. Can't get the clicker to work now. Yeah. Right, okay. let me go back. Okay, start again. So I'm speaking very much on behalf of the Natural Capital Committee and all my colleagues and the Secretariat. And the first point I want to make, and as Dieter has just made, is of course that the the culmination of a lot of the discussion and ideas that and the um, the whole debates that have been going on for the last seven years in the Natural Capital Committee came to really fruition in this 25 year environment plan, where the overarching aim of this, as stated many times, is to leave the environment in a better state than it is at present. And not only that to leave the environment in a better state, but to recognise that the environment itself is incredibly important for many of the societal benefits that we, we want, we desire and we utilise on a daily basis. So that the, the nature itself underpins many things like clean air, clean and plentiful water, thriving plants and wildlife, reduce risk of harm from environmental hazards, enhance beauty um, and mitigation and adaptation to climate change, which Baroness Brown will be speaking about after the break. But also the suggestion, as Dieter made um, before, that was come through very firmly from, from Dieter and the economists on the Natural Capital Committee, that we should be using public money 
to pay for the maintenance enhancement of these public goods because of the benefits they provide to all of us on a daily basis. Nature isn't free. It's not a freely available resource. It's something we really, need, really, really do need to value and properly value it um, in order to make sure that we, we conserve it uh, going forwards. So the framework that we came up with, and this was actually right at the beginning when we, we, we published a how to do it manual, because people were saying, well, what does this look like on the ground? What is a natural capital framework? And a natural capital framework gets, can be split into three parts. The first part are the stocks. So these are the natural capital assets. They're the species, the communities, the landscapes, ecosystems, soils, water, air, all of those things that are part of what we would broadly call nature. But also there's the, the, the below ground parts like the soils, like the geology, um, et cetera. Those things, that's all of that is our nat are our natural capital assets. And if we look at the function of the extent, the quality, the spatial configuration of those, they provide these flows, these really important ecosystem services, which the flows. So these are things like pollination, CO2 sequestration, soil erosion protection, water flow regulation, water and air purification, land for recreation, and also really important habitats for biodiversity. So all of those are ecosystem services that are provided by that mixture of, of stocks. But it's from those, and I remember Georgina Mace making the point really clearly at the beginning, they are only ecosystem services if they have a public good, if they provide a societal benefit. And so all of those can be, all of those ecosystem services can be matched onto societal benefits, um, public goods. So pollinated crops, 75% of our crops in the world are pollinated. We need pollinators, we need pollination habitats. We're all craving for a more stable climate and to lower atmospheric carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide sequestration leads to those equitable climates. Flood risk protection, clean air, clean water, good physical, mental and uh, mental well-being from being in recreational spaces and also a thriving wildlife. All of those are those public goods which we should be paying public money to conserve and to enhance. So that's very much the framing of the natural capital and that framework you will find in our how to do it manual, which I think we published in 2016, right at the beginning. But when you look at the 25 year environment plan, there are three key questions I think we still need to ask and we're still struggling to ask. And the first one is um, what stocks are the most important to measure and conserve? We can't measure and conserve everything. That's always the rule of conservation. When you think about it, what, what do we want to prioritise when we're conserving natural capital stocks? The second one is, where are the, where are the data gaps? Where do we need to fill data gaps? And, and, and what have we already got in terms of these? We have got some incredible data sources about nature in the UK, but where are those gaps in there? And the third thing is then how do we urgently fill these data gaps to ensure that we do have a baseline against which we can measure improvement in the environment over the next 25 years? And I would say, and I hope, my, I hope the rest of the Natural Capital Committee would agree, these are three key questions that we've been grappling with over the last couple of years. And very much some of these are coming through in the final report and also in the assessment that came out last week as well. So, First of all, let's start with that first question. In a natural capital framework, which stocks are most important to measure? Now, if you look at this flow chart here, I've got on the screen, so take this sort of this, this basic flow chart. Immediately, I think all of us, myself included, we always start with thinking the stocks, let's measure the stocks, then we'll measure the flows, and then we'll measure the public goods. But this immediately illustrates a problem because you can measure all the stocks in the world but actually, you really want to be focusing on the stocks that lead to the flows that underpin those ecosystem services and the public goods. So in some ways, you need to be going the other way around. You start with what public goods are we thinking about and then think what flows do they require and then think about, well, what stocks underpin those flows? But being very mindful that actually quite a lot of public goods or quite a lot of flows are underpinned by one or two natural capital assets. So that in fact, these, if I, if I had a pointer, that far right hand end of public goods, you'd find that most public goods can be underpinned by a number of, number of key stocks. And it's really finding those sort of hot spots of stocks 
that we ought to be looking for. So let me just give you an example, because somebody said to me recently, I'm um, from a government department, well, what does a natural capital asset map look like? What should we actually be measuring? You know, show me what you mean. So I thought, right, okay, let me give you one example here. And I'm going to use this catchment. It's one I know well. There are many other examples. But this is one that I know that know the work that's been done here. So within a natural capital framework, if we're thinking about the benefits, then your question here would be, in this catchment, which is north of Oxford, the even low catchment, which natural capital stocks are important to conserve for flood risk protection? So your public good is flood risk protection in here. Now, to work out flood, flood risk protection, um, this, this looks more complicated than it needs to be. You, you will, you, the, the sort of usual method is to use these uh, hydrological models called vertical water balance, balance models. And in here, you put in vegetation cover, soil type, topography, geology slope at a 30 meter resolution. If you look at the far right hand side with any cover, the whole drainage basin. And from that, for each 30 meters, this model will work out what contribution that little pixel is making towards overland flow. So when you have a storm event, what you end up with is water flowing, uh, flowing through. Right, let's move on. So. What's your input look like? Well, your input then are your asset maps, and it's asset maps of land cover, topography, soil type, and geology in the even though drainage base catchment. That's what you use as the input to this model. So you've got your land cover in there, and you've got your soils. Both of those maps, those would be your asset maps that come from publicly available databases. And what you, when you put it through that model, what you end up with your output map for the even low catchment will be as follows. And the areas that you see in blue on there are, are blue because of the combination of the land cover, the soil type um, and the slope mean that they are really important in reducing overland flow in a storm event. So therefore, they're holding the water back and not allowing the water to rush into the rivers and flood Oxford. Something's very close to my heart. However, the areas in red behave like bare soil. So the water, the rain will land on that and shoot over the land and and go to rapidly into the river and cause a flood event. So in the even load catchment then, if you're fo focusing on the natural capital stocks that are important for flood risk reduction, you'll be looking at those areas in blue. Those are the areas you want to conserve. But let me just make another point here. If you map the even load catchment of areas that are important for biodiversity or a thriving wildlife, and you just look at the difference, the areas in blue on the left and the areas in green on the right, there isn't much overlap. And this is a really important point. We can't use habitat type to underpin or assume it will always be habitat types that we can conserve and they will provide the necessary assets to also provide benefits for flood risk. So it's a really important point to be made in there because I think we can we can quickly go down a habitat route and actually not capture the right information. And that's the point in there. So the advice from the NCC then is that we should be focusing on measuring stocks that underpin important ecosystem services. We should have a systems approach for measuring stocks. So assessments are, are based not around individual habitat patches, but are capturing a whole basin catchment. Um, but also there is already much data necessary for measuring stocks. And this is the other point, we don't need to start from the beginning again. But the top down coordination is now urgently needed to address these critical data gaps that I'll come on to in a minute. And so this is the next part. And this is very much came through from the incredible work also that the um, Natural Capital Committee Secretariat have done over the last eight months to say, where are the greatest data gaps in our current knowledge on UK natural capital stocks? because anyone that's worked on data from the UK knows there are some incredible data resources. And a lot of this has been collected by the government departments over many, many years. And we must use that rather than starting again from the beginning. But what we found in our report is there's four critical data gaps that we identified. There are data gaps in terms of spatial, spatial coverage, temporal coverage, determining conditioning of stock and data accessibility. And I'll give you some examples um, now in the following slides. So the first one is significant spatial data gaps. And the example I'm going to give is in the quality of our air. 
So our best air quality network is the automatic urban and rural network. And you can see that on the left hand slide in the green. And we've got currently 170 automatic air quality monitoring stations that basically do real time monitoring of quality of air. So really incredible resource in there. But just eyeballing that, you can see there are large gaps. There's large gaps in rural areas in particular. And I think it's um, this is one area where we need to think about where can we have where and how can we fill those gaps to ensure that we have full spatial coverage of England, not these 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 big patches where we can we know what's going on in the cities, but we have no idea what's going on in the urban or the peri urban areas. If you look at the one on the right, this is airborne particulate matter. In fact, there's only four stations routinely monitoring the UK airborne particulate matter, although I suspect some are covered by the green. But the point is still in there. We have got these significant spatial data gaps. The second one is gaps in temporal coverage. If we want to measure the trends in whether or not something's getting better or worse and model what's happening to the flows, we need to have regular intervals in time, hopefully every couple of months or even every year in order to be able to do this. If you look at this, these are our major, um, these are our major stocks of species, communities and landscapes. We've got soils, it's the Cranfield soil maps, those are pretty consistent. Land cover maps, fantastic land cover maps come out from CEH, but they come out every couple of years. The last time we routinely uh, surveyed the hedgerow data in a publicly available resource was in 2007. The national tree map was um, the last time we, um, we resourced and looked at our national tree coverage, it was 2017. Uh, protected areas, 2020's most recent one. And you look at the surface water classification from the, um, this is the, uh, the water um, framework directive. You'll see there are two cycles in there. We're now behind on that. And peatlands was in 2010. We can't make a proper assessment of the trends if we don't have regular data in there. And this is a big problem. I would, and we flagged this up in the report. Another one is actually in the condition of the UK's natural capital stocks. Many of them, we simply don't measure the condition. And I don't want to get at the Water Framework Directive because at least we are measuring the conditions in there. And this is going to continue when we, when we exit Brexit. However, we can't assume that the Water Framework Directive is able to do everything. And in fact, it, it, small rivers and small lakes are not covered. So if you just look at the Eastern England here, those um, networks in green are those that have been assessed and those in purple are not assessed. We have no idea of the condition of those lakes and wetlands and rivers that are in purple. So how much does this account for? Well, if we look at this in the whole of in the six counties of East England um, of the lakes, only 18 percent are assessed for quality and 71 percent of the rivers. And in the uh, in the in England, 12 percent of the lakes overall are assessed and and the small water bodies and 70 cent, 77 percent of the rivers. Very, very small numbers of the lakes and, and wetlands. Yet in terms of biodiversity, these possibly are some of our most important re reservoirs. The last point is the accessibility of some of UK's key data on stocks. We talk about open source. I remember very clearly when I started at Q and also started on the Natural Capital Committee being told that the data on stocks would be open source. Seven years, six, seven years on, the ones in brown, so the soils, the land cover maps, the hedgerow data and the national tree map are not open source. They are behind a paywall. The ones in blue, so the National Forest Inventory Protected Area Surface Water Classification are open source. Does it matter that we have these ones behind a paywall and people can't afford to begin them? Well, let me just go back to the even load catchment. If I use the open source data to map the soils, that is what you get. If I use the payment for use um, version, which is the, um, the, the soilscape data from um, Cranfield, that's what you get. You get a huge difference in the model output, depending on whether or not you use the open source or the payment for use. And this is a really critical point that needs to be tackled at a national level, I think now, about these, these national databases and who is going to fund them. So just to conclude on that section, then there is inconsistent spatial coverage. The temporal coverage is extremely patchy. The determining of conditions of stocks is highly variable. 
and data accessibility is poor for some of the UK's key environmental data sets. So what can we do about it? I don't want to end on a low note. I think all of us, our worry cup is probably well and truly over full. But I think there are ways around this one. And I do want to now finish in the last five minutes by talking about our ideas about a natural capital baseline. And this will very much hopefully feed on through to some of the discussions that go on this afternoon. What should we be measuring and where? And how? This is the really key thing I want to come on to here. And I want to actually come back to this man, Dudley Stamp, who was born between 80, he lived between 1898 and 1966. He was a prominent British geographer and studied at King's College in London. And he directed um, the publication of the, the Land Utilisation Survey of Britain. And a lot of the current policy, government policy and land use control in Britain can be traced back to this survey. So this was a baseline survey, but how did he do it? Well, he did it this way. He had a survey, he surveyed the whole of the country, but using volunteers, citizen scientists, colleagues, students, school teachers and pupils to a scale of six inches to a mile. And the publication of the maps began in 1933 and was completed in 1948. What did they look like? Well, everyone went out literally with colouring pencils and they coloured in the um, the yellow is moorland and heath, light green is grassland, dark green woodland, brown arable, etc. That is the map. And you'll see this is Cockermouth up in the Lake District. A lot of the area there was yellow, yellow moorland and heath. Now, one of the reasons for doing this was to say, where should we be planting more trees? So therefore, that was a sole sort of one of the key aims of what they set out. And therefore, they're trying to look at what the woodland cover was like. So how much change has gone on then since Dudley Stamp? This is the 1930 land cover map and we um, converted it using a satellite. We converted it so it's comparable to the CEH land cover map of 2015. And what you'll see in here is this was London in 1930 and the green in there are the trees. And this is London now. And you'll see large increase not only in urban areas, but also large increase in forest cover. This is Thetford in 1930. Thetford Forest, note the name. This is Thetford presently. Large increase in urban areas, large increase in forest cover. In fact, if you look at what's happened to the forest cover in the UK since the 1940s, you'll see there's been a really large increase that's gone on. So what lessons can we learn then from this 1930s policy? Well, first of all, they undertook a baseline census at the beginning of the process to determine current states. There was a single clear policy objective to restore UK forests. They had a top-down approach in terms of vision. It was delivered by a number of bodies, government bodies, but centrally coordinated by one body, in this case, the Forestry Commission. And then they made subsequent measures of UK forests at the same spatial scale over subsequent years to assess progress and determine trends. So just really to conclude then, I think this is this is this whole approach is is where we've been talking and, and really trying to um, advise the government in that we strongly recommend the government adopts a similar approach to, to developing a natural capital environmental census. And the single aim is to develop a clear natural capital baseline of the UK stocks. You need approaches which can be repeated in subsequent years to establish trends over time. And it's only by doing this that we'll be able to properly determine trends in the UK's natural capital stocks and then the flows from that and our progress towards leaving the environment in a better state in 25 years time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cathy. Um, we now move to the uh, contribution from Tamara Finkelstone from the uh, as permanent secretary at DEFRA. Uh, as I said at the outset, we've had fabulous support from our secretary in, DEF in, in DEFRA, uh, and we have uh, tried to take forward some of those key ideas that uh, Cathy uh, has set out. In particular, we've been pushing really hard to try to get the support for the natural capital census into the comprehensive spending review and we remain hopeful that we're going to achieve that because you have to think what happens if we don't what happens if we do not deliver a census well the answer is we won't know what we're doing 
in a very serious sense. And if we don't know what we're doing, then we're going to miss the opportunities going forward. And then the OEP is not going to be hold, able to hold the government to account because it won't be able to assess what's out there. So this is, uh, I think I could put it this way on behalf of the committee, a no-brainer. This has to be done. If the government's serious about uh, natural capital, serious about the 25-year plan, serious about the statutory targets, this is the way to go. And it's not rocket science. Dudley Stamp could do it without any of the modern technologies we have available to us. We can do it now. And we'll explore this afternoon in the Science Symposium some further ideas on how we can bring the citizens into this and use some citizen science to engage people with their own natural environment and helping to make this, these things happen. So thanks, Cathy, very much. We'll come to Q&A a bit later in the day. Next up is um, Tamara Finkelston uh, to bring this uh, session to a conclusion. Thank you very much. And um, let me start with an apology of uh, having to record this as I'm not able to be there in person um, and also to be recording this myself because I recognise that the quality um, of this recording may not be quite what it ought to be. Um, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity um, of today's event uh, to have that opportunity to thank the Natural Capital Committee and members over the last eight years and the Secretariat for the, the outstanding contribution that they've made. Um, I think the NCC is an incredible example of the civil service and eminent uh, external experts working hand in glove to break new ground. Um, and never anything but independent, obviously. Uh, uh, and, but there's a huge amount that we can uh, learn from how government can make best use of such expertise um, by uh, working with expert advisors over a prolonged period to deliver tangible policy change and, um, and real delivery. And I think, look, the achievements of the NCC are well known to those who are joining um, this conference today. Uh, the existence and content of the 25-year environment plan owes so much to the work of the NCC. Uh, launched by the Prime Minister in 2018, it underpins the vision promulgated by the committee to see a positive environmental legacy for future generations. And now across uh, uh, the key areas of the plan that will have statutory uh, basis in the Environment Bill that um, is returning to committee stage uh, in the House of Commons this week. Um, and of course, the Office of Environmental Protection that will hold the government uh, to account for delivery. Um, and the NCC has provided such a strong framework for the OEP to build on uh, to assess our progress against the plan. Um, the principles for delivery of polluter pays, public money for public goods um, and uh, environmental uh, net gain championed by the committee um, find their statutory home uh, in the Environment Bill and in the Agriculture Bill uh, and um, delivered through major projects such as extended uh, producer responsibility on packaging and environmental land management. Um, and the committee has brought focus and action to the development of robust metrics and the importance of having a comprehensive baseline from which to measure change. Um, the collaboration with uh, the Office for National Statistics and DEFRA has enabled the production of the first ever UK national natural capital accounts um, and advice on a natural capital baseline has led to the uh, natural capital and uh, ecosystem assessment pilot, which we hope we will develop further. Um, as a long time Treasury official, I take my hat off to the triumph of achieving changes in the Green Book um, to incorporate a natural capital framework. Um, it's a key route to influencing policy making and uh, better focused public spending. And the How to Do It workbook uh, recognises the importance that you can't just have it in the Green Book, but um, need to build the skills and understanding in policy makers uh, to make a real difference. Um, and as we, as we get towards 2021 
and the opportunity for the UK to lead on the world stage at both the climate and biodiversity COPs. Uh, the NCC has really helped to lay the foundation for the UK uh, championing the role of nature-based interventions and a natural capital framework. So it is an extraordinary set of achievements um, that the OEP and the provisions of the Environment Bill will be building on. Um, all members of the committee, past and present, deserve admiration and thanks. And I know that they feel really well served by an excellent secretariat. Uh, but a special thanks must go to Dieter Helm for your leadership and determination. It's been one of the um, great pleasures of this job to have the opportunity uh, to have meetings with you. I think your fearless ability to take things from first principles, uh, to think big picture, but uh, put in the actions to drive real delivery and to be ambitious but practical. Uh, it's an admirable set of skills and um, would, has served the nation well. And as I say, we look to build on it in future. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak today, though not there in person. Um, and thank you for all that the NCC has done. Well, thank you very much, Tamara, for those extremely kind words. Uh, I think it's the committee that deserves the praise. Um, so thank you for that. Um, that brings to a conclusion the first part of today's uh, conference. Uh, we break now uh, and uh, reassemble and get underway at 10.45, where we have uh, two ministers, uh, the chair of the Adaptation Committee of the Climate Change Committee, and uh, the Climate Change Committee members uh, who will be joining us for the Q&A, uh, which will take us through to lunchtime before the Science Symposium this afternoon. So see you all back at 10.45 prompt, please. Thank you.
Welcome back to the second session of our main conference uh, this morning. Um, I'm delighted that we've got uh, three uh, key players in uh, our natural capital world. Uh, we're going to kick off with uh, uh, Zach Goldsmith, uh, Minister, um, and um, uh, I'll say a few words on uh, the international front in a second. We then have Baroness Brown, who is uh, leading on the ad adaptation, chairs the adaptation committee of the Climate Change Committee. Absolutely crucial the interface between uh, the broader natural capital and the uh, net zero agenda. And then Kemi Badnock from the Treasury. And as I indicated earlier on in the conference, we think the Treasury link and the uh, embedding of natural capital into uh, the economy and therefore economic policy generally is utterly crucial to deliver um, uh, our green and more prosperous land. Uh, sorry about that. That uh, demonstrates the uh, need for infrastructure, not only green, but also fibre. Uh, but sorry about that. So I was just saying um, uh, we've got our lineup um, uh, for this second session with uh, Zach Goldsmith, Baroness uh, Brown and Kimmy Badnock. Um, we're going to then have a, 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 a switch over to our panel session, bringing the Natural Capital Committee members uh, into the uh, discussion. Uh, and Cathy, of course, who spoke earlier, there will be a one minute interlude there to uh, switch over to the panel. But I'll tell you about that when we get there. But uh, without further ado, uh, bearing in mind the criticality, not just of the uh, natural capital here, but globally, uh, and the importance of the two big events coming up uh, next year, uh, the CBD and the COP um, uh, conferences, um, uh, it's crucial that these things are brought together, that natural capital and climate change are brought together at the global level, and uh, absolutely delighted that Zach Goldsmith could find the time to uh, contribute to our conference today. So over to you and thank you, Zach. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dieter. Um, a real pleasure to be joining you. The last time we were speaking together, and Rebecca Powell was with us as well, it was a cold February morning, and the Prime Minister had just launched our COP26 climate campaign. Um, and if it weren't for the pandemic, now we'd likely be reflecting on the closing of the UN Conference on Biodiversity, the CBD in Kunming, and we'd be just about welcoming the world to the climate conference in Glasgow. And that all seems like another age now. And I think in many respects, it is another age. Coronavirus seems to have changed absolutely everything. Um, it is itself likely the consequence of our uh, misuse or abuse of nature, but it will be dwarfed, as we know, by the impacts of environmental degradation and climate breakdown. Last month, we heard that the populations of key species have declined by more than two thirds in my lifetime, a mere a blip, a nanosecond in evolutionary terms. Uh, two of every five species of plants are, according to Kew Gardens in a report just a couple of weeks ago, now threatened with extinction. That's twice what we thought uh, just four years ago. We are literally extinguishing the magic of the natural world, including, of course, the medicines, foods, materials of the future. We haven't even begun to understand the implications. In our warmer, more acidic ocean, we face the loss of coral reefs on which a quarter of marine species, millions of people rely. Um, a billion people depend on fish for their protein. Uh, but we brought the world's great fisheries to their knees. Uh, from the Cerrado to the Cuvette Centrale, the world's great forests provide the temperate climate and weather, clean air and water and resources all of us rely on. Uh, directly around a billion people depend on forests for their livelihoods. And yet we're destroying those forests at a rate of 30 football pitches every single minute. And the, the problem with all this is that there's a risk that we become accustomed to these 
big numbers. We keep hearing them and, and we almost become used to them. Um, so let me put it another way. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old. If you scale that back to one year, we've been around for less than one hour. Our industrial revolution began less than a minute ago, much less than a minute ago, and in under, under one second, we've destroyed more than half of the world's tropical forests that are home to around 80% of the world's terrestrial biodiversity. Evidence published just last week uh, suggests that forest loss alerts have increased by more than three quarters since the start of the pandemic compared to the previous three years. And for all the talk of an anthro pause as a consequence of coronavirus, common sense tells us that whatever very short term breathing space nature might have had is not going to last very long. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to find the words to capture the true horror of what's unfolding. Um, clearly, it's an ecological tragedy. Um, but as this committee, the Natural Capital Committee, knows perhaps better than anyone, it is economic madness as well. The world's poorest people are hit hardest when the free but rarely valued services that nature provides begin to collapse and fail. Uh, this pandemic has already driven 100 million people back into base poverty. Uh, and there is no pathway to net zero all the sustainable development goals that does not involve protecting and conserving nature on an unprecedented scale. So for the sake of people and planet, turning this trajectory around is objectively the principal challenge of our age. Uh, at the end of September, um, just a few weeks ago, the world gathered virtually for the UN General Assembly. And at the summit, more than 75 world leaders signed up to an ambitious, radical even leaders pledge for nature. It was a commitment to put nature and biodiversity on a road to recovery by 2030. And although there is perhaps a deserved sense of declaration fatigue, uh, after all, if the world's countries all followed both the letter and spirit of all the declarations and commitments they've signed over the years, we probably wouldn't be having this discussion now. But this declaration, signed in September by 75 countries, feels different. Its language is different. It's more urgent. It explicitly recognizes the failure of past agreements. It explicitly invites people to judge signatories on the basis of how they set about honoring the commitments in the declaration. Um, and I'm proud that the UK played a critical role in strengthening the pledge, insisting on the strongest possible language. But the challenge now, of course, is to turn those words into action, both here, at home, and around the world. And with all three Rio conventions uh, meeting in the same year for the first time, 2021 is clearly the moment to do it. Uh, a few weeks ago, we heard that the millionth person had died of this appalling pandemic. And even those nations that have avoided the virus itself, mostly small island developing states, have nevertheless seen their economies utterly battered. But if there's a silver lining, it's that the world is realizing that if the ecological and economic challenges we face are linked, so too are the solutions. And from that has come a commitment from countries all around the world that as they map out their, their respective economic recovery plans, they have a chance to do things differently, to build back greener and to build back better. And that's just not just another uh, box to tick. Uh, it means making sustainability the lens through which all decisions ultimately are made. And to some extent, that's already happening in relation to carbon. Uh, there, there are gaps and there are big contradictions still, but I think um, my colleague Tamara would agree that across Whitehall, departments are pulling increasingly in the same direction uh, to meet our legally binding commitments to meet net zero and showing that cutting emissions can deliver growth and jobs. And it's happening in the market too, sometimes in spite of the politics. It's striking that coal use has fallen faster in the US under the current administration than it did under the previous one. Um, electric vehicles are about to overtake the combustion engine. The low energy economy has gained ground beyond what anyone predicted. And the race to zero is taking off right across society. I mean, who would have predicted that the cost of solar, for example, would have fallen 90% since the back in banking crisis 12 years ago. But when it comes to attaching a value to nature, and to nature proofing our respective portfolios, we have a very, very long way to go. Incentives to destroy forests today are 40 times greater than incentives to protect them. It's still very much the case that even while we depend on them profoundly, completely, forests are still today worth more dead than alive. 
Uh, the market is the most powerful force for change, other than nature herself. But until the market recognizes the value of natural systems and applies cost to the destruction of those systems, that force will take us over the cliff. And changing that is, I think, the biggest challenge we face. It's what this committee was set up to do, and it's increasingly becoming the focus of the government. From farming to finance, we're taking the next steps to embed a natural capital approach, whether that's Kemi's work uh, to update the green books, Professor Dasgupta's report, uh, which Kemi is also, I think, going to be talking about, or using our newly independent status to switch our land use subsidies away from incentivizing environmental damage towards rewarding farmers for good stewardship of the land. We're legislating for, among many, many other things in the environment, the biodiversity net gain. I think that's a world first. It requires all new developments to add at least 10% to existing biodiversity. Uh, and in, an, in another world first, we're taking steps to ban the import of agricultural commodities whose production causes illegal deforestation. Commodity production is the cause of 80% of the world's deforestation. Uh, we're working with businesses to design a framework for nature-related financial disclosures to help companies quantify, disclose, reduce environmental risk. And as presidents of the next climate cop we're determined to put nature at the heart of the world's response to climate change nature-based solutions like mangroves peatlands woodlands offer around a third of the cost-effective mitigation solutions to climate change that we need as well as helping species recover and alleviating poverty and helping communities adapt to change but despite that huge contribution they attract a mere three percent less in fact than three percent of global climate finance so we're calling on donor countries to escalate their support for nature. And because public money alone isn't going to be enough, we're building alliances of ambitious countries committed to identifying and then shifting the incentives that they control in favor of sustainability. For example, $700 billion spent by the top 50 food producing countries on often destructive land use subsidies every single year. Um, the UK is committed to providing leadership here and around the world. We absolutely know that we need to profoundly reset our relationship with nature. And as we find our way through this challenge, I think it is worth reflecting on how the advice and the scrutiny of this committee has shaped and improved our understanding and our approach. And I know from my own experience in uh, recent months speaking to uh, my counterparts and people all around the world that the work of this committee has gone global. Uh, as Dieter said only a few minutes ago, it is one of global Britain's greatest exports, the work of the Natural Capital Committee. Um, so speaking for the whole of the government, I want to thank you for a decade of wise counsel and for all you do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. That's very kind of you. Um, and I think that um, you, you nicely balance uh, the sheer scale of the destruction at the global level and the challenges with the scale of the opportunities and what can actually be done to positively put this right. A, a lot of environmental discussion tends to be doom and gloom, and there's an understandable reason why that's the case. But it is um, uh, our duty to put that right. And the objective that uh, we have at the Natural Capital Committee or have had above us, which is to leave the natural environment in a better state for the next generation than we found it, uh, requires exactly that kind of proactive engagement. And uh, we're pleased that we've been able to provide uh, advice to you on how to marry up uh, the COP and the CBD and to make sure that natural capital goes to the heart of the climate change uh, agenda. And that neatly segues into uh, second presentation in this uh, session. Um, we at the Natural Capital Committee uh, have uh, worked uh, alongside and in close cooperation with the Climate Change Committee. Uh, the Climate Change Committee has a obvious carbon remit. We have a remit across all the natural capitals. And one of the things that we've been most uh, exercised about and tried to put a great deal of effort into is to make sure that in using the natural environment, focusing on sequestration by nature, of carbon, that uh, we do it in ways which uh, go with the grain of the other natural capitals in addition to carbon so that we get the maximum overall environmental bucks by bringing the carbon agenda 
and the broader natural capital agenda together. And uh, we've been extremely fortunate in having as our interlocutor in this, uh, uh, Baroness Brown and the whole team behind the Adaptation Committee of the Climate Change uh, uh, Committee. And um, we have engaged all the way through that process. And I think in the Agriculture Bill, and the Environment Bill, we see the beginning of the fruition of that uh, engagement. Uh, in the 10 goals in the 25 year plan, one of them is carbon. It's absolutely crucial. And although there are only four of the 10 goals which have statutory targets or will have in 222, of course, uh, uh, the carbon already has that. So it's great that uh, Baroness Browns have, the, uh, have been able to find the time to talk to us today. And uh, Julia, really look forward to what you have to say. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dieter. And it's also great to follow um, Zach Goldsmith's passionate uh, emphasis of the link between natural environment and addressing climate change. So I want to illustrate how just how influential the work of the national the natural capital committee has been on the way we we now look at environment issues at the CCC. Uh, and in doing so, I, I also want to highlight the critical role that has been played by Georgina Mace, uh, a distinguished member of the NCC and then subsequently uh, the Adaptation Committee uh, and a great friend to all of us, um, highly strongly missed uh, and of course missed I think by the natural environment uh, for which she did so much. But anyway, let me just, oops, let me just start by saying a couple of words about what the uh, Commission on Climate Change does. Uh, the Commission on Climate Change has two committees. Uh, the one you normally hear about uh, is the one which advises the government on the level of carbon budgets, and it's currently working on the sixth carbon budget, uh, and also scrutinizes progress uh, towards meeting those five yearly targets. And then there is the Adaptation Committee, uh, which advises the government on the five yearly climate change risk assessment, uh, and looks at the progress that we are making on addressing those risks through the National Adaptation Programme. Uh, and I'm going to start by talking a bit about the um, Adaptation Committee and then move on, uh, the committee's work, and then move on to the uh, Committee on Climate Change uh, Mitigation Committee's work. So uh, one of the things that uh, I think came out very much from what Zach said was this fact that actually we need to think both about adaptation and mitigation uh, in, in addressing climate change. Mitigation alone is not enough. And this is just to remind us that even if we are globally on that 1.5 to 2 degree path, that Paris path that we so much need to be on and want to be on and are committed to in the UK, uh, we will still see some quite significant effects of the changing climate. So, for example, 2018, um, we have a, a, a 10 to 20 percent chance of having a summer like 2018 at the moment, a really hot summer, heatwave summer. By 2050, even on that 1.5 to 2 degree path, that will be the norm. We will have a 50 percent chance. Um, one million more people will be at risk of flooding by 2050 uh, unless we take further adaptation measures on this 1.5 to 2 degree path. So we we really, people have really got the mitigation message, but we have to do adaptation as well. Uh, mitigation is about reducing the hazard, so reducing the amount of greenhouse gas, so we won't get such large temperature increases, we won't get so much more flooding. But adaptation is about addressing our exposure and our vulnerability to that hazard. And we need both if we're going to reduce the impacts, the impacts like deaths, the impacts like flood damage, the impacts like um, reducing the numbers of, of healthy species, the impacts like um, crop productivity. So we are now very much in our work taking this natural capital approach. Um, we look at uh, how the climate impacts the stocks of natural capital. Um, so for example, water, the quantities of water, the impacts of drought. We look at how the climate change impacts the flows of the services from that natural capital. Uh, so, for example, 
the timber produced by our forests, um, which also um, which also deliver carbon removal, and the impact that, for example, that needle blight in Scotland is having on on that because of the increasing temperatures. Uh, and then we look at the the benefits to humans or the, the, the disbenefits. So the flooding, disrupting or damaging buildings and reducing our access to nature. So we, we look at in the adaptation committee at the impacts of climate change and the need to adapt across the stocks, the services and, and the benefits. But of course, the really good news is that actually the solution to all of this as, as um, has already been emphasized, the solution to this is by investing in natural capital. Much of our adaptation comes through investing in our natural capital, um, and that also can deliver mitigation benefits. Whoops, I'm sorry, I've just lost the uh, slide clicker. So it's just having to reconnect. So the last climate change risk assessment, which was in, in 2017, so in fact, we're just preparing for uh, the evidence base for another one, the five years on, they emphasized that there were six major uh, and important risks to the UK that we needed to be looking at. Uh, flooding, the risks of high temperatures, the risks of shortage of water, uh, the specific risks to natural capital itself, the risks to the food supply and the emerging pests and diseases. And as you can see, all of those uh, have a, uh, a really, really strong natural environment theme uh, and the functioning, a healthy and functioning natural environment is absolutely key to addressing all of those climate risks. In our last Progress. Well, in, sorry, the, the approach we now take in looking at progress um, in adaptation on the adaptation committee uh, is now that we use the, the natural capital approach of looking at how the um, climate change is affecting natural capital, our natural capital assets and how it's affecting uh, the services that those natural capital assets supply. So the natural capital, the work of the natural capital committee is now truly embedded in the way we uh, the way we review things on the uh, committee on climate change and uh, this is our last review done in in 2019 um, and unfortunately demonstrating as I think Zach's remarks indicated to us demonstrating a significant adaptation shortfall particularly for the natural environment sectors all of the natural environment sectors highlighted there uh, are in our red or amber categories uh, and as Zach has said we very much need all new policies for the environment to reflect the challenge of climate change and it was good to hear his comments about the environment bill and the agriculture bill. So let me give you um, an example of us using the natural capital uh, approach. Uh, this is in our uh, in our report from the committee on um, uh, on uh, on land use, uh, and this was uh, a study of the of the petrol uh, river area, um, looking at the benefits of taking anticipatory change, anticipating the change in climate that they are going to see around there uh, and changing the use of that land. And as you can see, the natural capital um, approach to looking at the benefits of this demonstrated very clearly in that particular case, how taking early action uh, could deliver significantly larger natural capital benefits than leaving it till later. And of course, if you leave change till much too late, you may actually have significant disbenefits and may not be able to get uh, any positive benefits whatsoever. Now, that was a very specific um, study for an area around the Petrel River, but I think a really useful uh, demonstration of how important the natural capital accounting approach is now for helping us to think about these really key decisions we need to make for the future. So let me now move on to uh, how do we meet our net zero target. Well, in our pathway to net zero, we published in the Committee on Climate Change's report uh, last year, uh, it really emphasized the, the critical role of nature and the natural environment. We're going to need more forest and woodland creation 
perhaps uh, even as much as 50,000 hec- 50, hectares per year. We're going to need peatland and wetland restoration. We're going to be needing to grow a lot more energy crops. We're going to be needing diet change. Uh, we're going to be needing to see improved yields in order to allow all that land use change. So a lot of things uh, in meeting net zero depend on the contribution of the natural environment. And and perhaps just to give you a, a kind of scale of that that I think emphasizes what, what Zach was saying earlier. Uh, when we had the 80% target, we needed to get our emissions down to 159 megatons of CO2. Uh, actually, the negative emissions we're going to be getting from land use when we get to net zero uh, from the trees, peat and wetland restoration, from wooding construction, from bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, these could add up to something over 70 megatons of emissions reduction. That's pretty much half of the extra emissions we need to to get rid of to get from the 80% to the 100% at the net zero target. So the natural environment will be playing an absolutely crucial role uh, in meeting those emissions reduction. So it's absolutely critical that it is in a healthy state in order to be able to do that. And here is, I think, a nice example of the use of um, natural capital, the natural capital accounting approach, um, in terms of the uh, the benefits of uh, woodland and uh, and uh, forest creation. So here, the woodland and forest creation providing um, some uh, I can't read the numbers unfortunately on this, but I think so over 60 billion of benefits in terms of greenhouse gas reduction, but. When we start to look at the other benefits we get, the recreation, the improvements to air quality, the benefits to our physical health, the flood management from planting those trees um, in in river appropriately in river catchment areas. When we add all of those in together, we move from just over 60 billion to almost 100 billion of benefits. So taking this natural capital approach gives us so much better business case uh, for taking these uh, these natural environment measures. And finally, uh, of course, acting on uh, adaptation and net zero using uh, natural using the natural environment delivers on so many um, multiple policy objectives. Uh, the one I'm particularly passionate about, partly because I'm I'm chairing the uh, the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Independent Climate Commission, and we're looking at what to do in in our cities, is this one of investing in urban green space. Uh, Investing in urban green space is great for wildlife, but it's great for us. Um, It reduces the urban heat island effect in our cities. It provides shade. Uh, It helps us with surface water flooding. It improves air quality. And yet when um, city and local councils are looking at their green space. They, there is a danger. They see it as a cost, a cost to maintain. So the importance of of using the natural capital accounting approach to make sure the right decisions are taken to expand the green space in our cities uh, is just hugely important. And of course, food security uh, and woodland cover uh, are also other areas where. Um, the uh, the adaptation, the net zero, and the multiple po- policy objectives all come together with the through the natural environment. So, just finally, what can you expect from the Climate Change Committee in the next few months? Well, importantly, we will be publishing our advice on the sixth carbon budget at the beginning of December, and there'll be uh, lots of uh, of uh, natural environment uh, uh, evidence in there. Then in uh, 2021, in the run-up to the COP, um, we'll be looking at the government's progress both in reducing emissions and adapting to climate climate change. So our annual review in June next year. And then we will be producing the evidence report for the third climate change risk assessment uh, in July of next year. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I've managed to communicate the, the big impact the work of the Natural Capital Committee is having on the work we do at the Committee on Climate Change and the really, really positive benefit that will be to all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. That's extremely clear 
incredibly encouraging and um, enormous agenda out ahead. And hopefully, if we win it eventually, even if it's uh, posthumously for our committee, uh, the argument for the baseline natural capital census, uh, we very much hope that, that would be an incredibly useful tool to you guys in working out um, the impacts of all the different options that you'll be considering going forward. And I really want to echo to that point you made about urban aspects. Uh, what we've been very keen to stress in the work of the Natural Capital Committee is the relationship between natural capital and people. And Georgina Mace was uh, in our first committee, I would say in, in a complimentary banged on about how big, for example, the air quality impacts were of doing natural capital. And, and Ian Bateman has uh, done incredibly important pioneering work on uh, comparing putting natural capital next to people and having natural capital more remote, of which trees are, of course, an important part. But that brings us to our third contribution for this session. Uh, and it's very fitting for our committee to have uh, Kimi Badenoch from the uh, Treasury. Uh, I stressed at the beginning of the conference how important we see uh, the natural capital agenda uh, and the environment being at the heart of economic policy. And if you go back to the 211 white paper that kicked all this off, the, the natural choice, um, its core um, rationale was precisely that the environment should no longer be treated as an additional separate and occasional luxury that we uh, could have when we could afford it to being absolutely central to the heart of economic policy. So great to have the uh, Economic Secretary of the Treasury along and very much looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Dieter, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to follow Baroness Brown and also uh, Minister Goldsmith and listening to all of the experts on the Natural Capital Committee today. So I've only been Exchequer Secretary for the past six months, but I know the NCC's work has proven to be invaluable, not just for me, but also my predecessors. And I wanted to start off by saying a big thank you for all of the efforts that um, you and the rest of the committee have made over the past decade. And while my role is focused on developing economic policy for the country, increasingly it also involves fighting climate change and safeguarding the environment. And I believe a natural capital approach is going to be integral to achieving those goals. And that's going to be particularly the case as we start our country's recovery from COVID-19. Firstly, uh, because the scientific evidence increasingly points to the fact that biodiversity loss puts us at greater risk of future pandemics. And secondly, because we need to find new ways of driving clean growth so that we can build back better, greener and stronger after this pandemic. So today I'm going to briefly outline where this government sees the economic opportunities from preserving and protecting our natural capital before turning to how we plan to seize them. But first, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about some of the NCC's achievements over the past years. As you might know, uh, its advice was instrumental in the development of the government's 25 year environment plan, which includes a vision for protecting and improving our natural capital. This is going to mark a real step change in the way we safeguard our natural resources. And it's down to DETA and the committee's efforts that very soon that vision will be given a statutory footing through the environment bill. But as well as helping to leave a better world for our children and grandchildren, the NCC has made an enormous contribution to instilling natural capital principles into present day decision making, including in areas of economic policy. And one of the best illustrations of this, as Minister Goldsmith mentioned, is the committee's updates to our 2018 Green Book. So for those of you who aren't closely involved in government, the Green Book gives our officials a framework against which they can evaluate the costs and benefits of a policy. And the NCC's work has given officials the tools to do this more thoroughly when it comes to policies relating to natural capital. But undoubtedly, one of the NCC's biggest achievements has been deepening our understanding of how the environment supports our economy. We've seen a fantastic example of that in the way the NCC has helped the ONS, the, Offices, the Office for National Statistics, create some of the most complete natural capital accounts of any country. These figures place an economic value on everything from our fossil fuels and agricultural biomass to the impact that living near a green space has on house prices. And you don't have to be a fan of spreadsheets to find these ONS reports fascinating reading. So do take a look if you get a chance. However, 
a natural capital approach is not just about attributing a financial value to rivers, forests and peatlands, although this is a good start. It's about recognising that these resources must be intertwined in our financial system and not stand distinct from it, as uh, Dieter just said. It's about continually improving our policies so that they drive sustainable growth. And it's about understanding that protecting the environment is integral to both a thriving economy and society for people today and generations tomorrow. And I think a good example of that point is the value of the carbon, of the carbon capture service provided by the world's trees. Mr. Goldsmith uh, referenced this. And according to a report by the Paulson Institute and the Nature Conservancy, that figure could be as much as could be as much as two hundred and sixty two billion dollars a year. And that number left me absolutely astonished. It underlines that if we fail to protect our forests, we'll not only find it far harder to prevent global warming, we'll also end up spending vast amounts more on tackling greenhouse gas emissions, money that could be spent on schools, hospitals, transport infrastructure or any number of things. So on government action, the chance to become both green and prosperous is an enticing vision. And to echo Dieter's words in the NCC's most recent report, it won't happen by default. And that's why the need to generate green jobs and build clean industries is at the very heart of this government's recovery agenda. You saw a sign of that commitment when last month the Prime Minister announced our plans for a green industrial revolution. And over the past months, we've made some important progress towards not only safeguarding our natural capital, but maximising its economic potential. As the Chancellor announced earlier this year, we're using the £640 million Nature for Climate Fund to turn an area larger than Birmingham into forest and to restore 35,000 acres of peatland. We've also launched our £40 million Green Recovery Challenge Fund to support environmental charities that de uh, deliver natural capital improvement projects across England. This money will not only protect the natural environment for years to come, it will generate and protect thousands of jobs, both in more traditional areas such, such as forestry and timber production and in the new green industries of the future. We're not just taking action, we're thinking carefully about how it should be best focused. Just as nature's processes don't respect national borders, the government recognises that biodiversity loss is a global problem that requires coordinated action between countries. That's why at the recent UN Biodiversity Summit, the Prime Minister committed to protect 30% of the UK's land within the next decade. And it's why we will shortly publish Professor Sir Partha Dasgupta's independent global review on the economics of biodiversity, which I know many people are very excited to see. This important report will not only provide an opportunity to help us better understand how to engage sustainably with nature while enhancing our collective health and well-being, it will allow the UK to demonstrate thought leadership on the global stage, just as we did through the groundbreaking Stern review into the economics of climate change nearly 15 years ago. So, as I've outlined, we're making progress on embedding a natural capital approach. But I'm all too aware that government investment, regulation and pledges can only take us so far. We also need to encourage the private sector to join the cause. There are already some great initiatives underway. HSBC is planning to launch the world's natural, largest natural capital asset management company, while increasing numbers of landowners are signing up to the Woodland Carbon Code, which aims to build a market for carbon credits from British Woodland. But we want to achieve even more, and that's particularly the case in areas like water quality, biodiversity and carbon capture. We've recently taken a major step forward on this front with the launch of a £10 million fund to help environmental projects generate revenue and attract private sector investment. And I know the committee has given excellent guidance in this respect, arguing for the creation of stable long-term regulatory frameworks to facilitate the flow of private capital into the natural environment and to reduce the burden on the public sector. We've taken this on board and we're continuing to seek ways of encouraging private sector involvement in natural capital initiatives. As a final note, I know the committee has also called for a natural capital baseline survey to help provide data on the location and condition of our natural capital assets, work that could play an important part in stimulating a green recovery. We've listened to that request and we've made five million pounds available to help pilot the idea this year. So I'll end by once more thanking the committee for all its work. You have indeed been a strong ally and a critical friend to the government over the past decade. And while the NCC may be winding down, 
rest assured that our commitment to embedding natural capital principles in our decision making remains as strong as ever. Of course, the task ahead of us isn't easy, but let's remind ourselves of what we can achieve by harnessing natural capital principles. A better environment, both for people today and generations to come, a thriving economy, and a greener, bolder and more prosperous Britain. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much indeed. You know, I'm reflecting on where we started back in 2012 and uh, many people thought that um, the 2011 white paper, The Natural Choice, uh, had bold ideas about putting the environment at the heart of the economy, etc. But actually not much content and, well, you know, if we didn't know what to do back in 2012, why not set up a committee and they can spend their time like in Yes Minister thinking about these things. <laughs> and if I contrast um, your presentation now with where we were back then, it is a transformation in the Treasury and in economic thinking. And that's kind of important because we care about getting our ideas across. But it's much more important for the economy as a whole because we're starting to see those opportunities, that prize out there, which Julia and um, Zach Goldsmith highlighted earlier. So thank you very much to your contribution uh, for your you, to our conference and thanks for finding the time. OK, we've now got a Q&A session and this is going to involve uh, the members of the Natural Capital Committee and questions put to us by uh, the audience, um, which uh, our extremely impressive conference organisers uh, are putting together. Um, uh, I'm someone who started life doing my thesis with an Olympus portable typewriter, Tipex and carbon paper, so I won't try to describe the technology that's being used to do this. But we're going to have a short break for about one minute while the organisers put the panel together and then we'll be straight back to the Q&A and we've got a good period of time through to 12.15 or just before uh, to try to address as many questions as, as possible and bring uh, the members of the uh, committee uh, into uh, the conference discussion. So we break now for one minute, uh, just over. Bear with us, please. And then we'll be back with the Q&A. Thank you very much indeed.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, it's now time for Q&A and we've had uh, lots of questions uh, from the audience uh, and I'm going to uh, put those uh, questions to uh, members of the NCC uh, who are all on the panel uh, for this session and um, or, or uh, as many as can be and um, we'll then take this discussion through to uh, 12 uh, 15 when we'll uh, break from the main conference ahead of the science uh, symposium this afternoon so um, uh, as with uh, all good audiences uh, the questions some of the questions are uh, extremely to the point and uh, uh, sharp and um, uh, the first one uh, which I want to pick is uh, to the point, uh, been asked by Ben Webster at the Times, uh, why is the NCC being shut down and will the OEP do everything the NCC does as effectively uh, and independently? Um, the first bit is um, uh, pretty straightforward. We have a term of office and as I said right at the beginning of the conference, it's been incredibly important that we have a clear job to do, we've done it, and I see no purpose whatsoever in perpetuating a committee um, uh, um, for the sake of having the committee. Um, and the key bit, and it's in the question, is really about how the segue happens from the OEP, uh, from the NCC to the OEP. Now we've done quite a lot on uh, giving advice on the OEP and how it takes things uh, forward. Uh, and I wondered um, who would like to pick up that um, uh, amongst the uh, team. Um, uh, I'm low to kind of pick on someone. Does anyone want to volunteer or otherwise I will assign the question across? Um, OK, well, if no one's going, I'm, I'm actually going to ask Ian this question. <laughs> and the reason I'm going to ask Ian is because um, you've thought a lot about effectiveness uh, and um, how to embed practical policy. So do you want to just kick us off on what you hope the OEP is going to do and um, uh, what the, the, some of the key issues you think are there? I think I'll say thank you. Data. <laughs> um, it's a really good question. Um, this is absolutely right about the first part of the question. The NCC was always time limited and indeed the second term of the uh, NCC was um, uh, not, not originally planned and really came from the effectiveness of the first period. Uh, if I have to answer the question as it's written, will the OEP do everything the NCC does? as effectively and independently. I, I have to say my view is no. Um, uh, it's got a different remit. Uh, that remit is more of a uh, policing remit than ours. Uh, we don't have a, a policing remit at all. And I think we're all pretty thankful for that, to be honest. Um, so it's not an easy job that the OEP is going to tackle. I think the thing that uh, is different between the two organisations that I perhaps would at very least like to be seen taken up elsewhere, I'm not sure it has to be within the OEP, is this forward-looking strategic view on uh, what should be rather than um, uh, what is and, and making sure that it's enforced. I think that's been pretty useful for the government. I think they've benefited from advice uh, that uh, is reflected in the 25-year plan and in, uh, for example, the reform of uh, rules over public spending uh, in the Green Book. Um, I do feel that is an important role to uh, be played uh, by advisors in that uh, area. At the moment, I can't see that being uh, taken up. The CCC are doing a great job but that is obviously focused on uh, net zero. I think we need something that is broader. Mm. Thanks, that's very helpful, Ian. Um, Cathy, I heard you nod on that. Do you want to come back in on that point? No, just that, no, it was more that I just agree with what Ian was saying there. I think the OEP has got a very different role to what the NCC has been doing. Uh, 
part of me thinks maybe maybe the work is now done. We need to say this is what we think should happen, but it's now for others to take that forwards. My concern is that um, that it's not it's still not entirely clear who those others are going to be, and I think it's that gap that's the is the concern right now. Thank, thanks, Kathy. Um, Melanie, um, we, as I said uh, uh, earlier on in the in, in the conference, um, we probably neglected the marine side um, uh, badly in the, the first period. And when we look at the OEP and the Environment Bill going forward, um, the marine side, do you think it's being properly captured? <coughs> And do you think the OEP will have the wherewithal to see that the marine side is properly incorporated uh, within the framework? And I have in mind, too, that the statutory targets, um, uh, although they could overlap with the marine area, are not explicit to that territory. And you've done great stuff with us in helping us shape recommendations on this front. Thanks, Dieter. Um, I'm actually just going to tackle one bit first which was the independence because one of our committee's advice is actually that the OEP should be accountable to parliament and not to government and I think that's still one that we would strongly recommend. In terms of marine, um, yeah I have concerns. Marine requires a lot of uh, monitoring. It's so far, it needs a lot more effort to think about how we can do monitoring, how we can do that baseline census uh, in, a, in a smarter, uh, cost-effective way, because there is a big prize. There's a lot of marine natural capital. It provides a lot of different services. And I don't think so far we've really managed to move from taking marine in a rather piecemeal way. We look at the fisheries, we look at uh, renewable energy, we look at shipping in a very separated way across government. And I'd really like to see the OEP grasp that sort of broader picture of, of, of the whole entity of marine. And I think we've started to bring that into the Natural Capital Committee, that thinking that, that the marine is so much more than fisheries and fish. But we still got a long way to go and we still need a lot more evidence, I think. And I think you asked me once, Dieter, you know, what does success look like? What's 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 a better marine environment going to be like? And I think we're still slightly struggling to identify that. But amongst the, those who know marine, there's just this feeling that there is so much more that we could do. And I'd really like to see the OEP strategically take that on. But I'm not convinced that they will have the resource to do that. Thanks. Um let me move on to, that's very helpful. Let me move on to uh, another question that's um, uh, come in about the uh, role of the Treasury and uh, the extent to which um, uh, the uh, possible investments are actually going to be built upon in, ter in terms of uh, public spending and so on and so forth. And I, I want to come at that um, question in a slightly uh, uh, um, uh, indirect way. I mean, Colin, you've spent, um, you, you've made massive contributions to our committee all the way through and, and very much focused on the accounting side of this. Um, we heard a lot about the Green Book, but um, in terms of an accounting framework, what is the prize that an accounting framework in national accounts can uh, help deliver when it comes to economic well-being from these natural capital assets? Well, it's exactly the uh, that you're raising in that question, Dieter, because by far and away the most relevant contribution that accounts make is in identifying what are the potential costs and benefits associated with not just investing to enhance, but also to maintain our natural assets. And one of the big problems that we've had to date is that we haven't recognized how we've been consuming our natural assets to benefit ourselves without ensuring that they are <clears throat> going forward. Now, one feature that having a proper system of in particular na national natural capital accounts will allow us to do would be to identify where we are really failing to maintain our natural assets and what resources we as a nation 
both the public sector through the Treasury and the private sector need to devote to ensuring that we don't go on seeing the deterioration of our natural assets. So that linking together that you've just um, made, Dieter, between accounting uh, and public expenditure is absolutely critical. Thanks, Colin. And I'm, I'm, I'm digging at the question that, that Paul asked from, from Friends of the Earth. And I think one of the things that, that really needs to register is, you know, uh, when people talk about assets and flows and national accounts and so on, lots of people who care passionately about the environment, the conservation movement, etc., you know, their eyes glaze over. But you really have to think through how radical it would be if our national accounts really did properly account for natural capital and exposed where we're not paying for the capital maintenance. You know, we all know what happens if you don't fill the holes up in the road, you don't do the capital maintenance for a physical road, eventually the road falls to bits and then you're economically much worse off and you're not bearing uh, that maintenance now, you're just leaving it for the next generation to pick up the mess. Well, if you really think through what genuine natural capital accounts will look like, it'll be very much more straightforward to identify the economic gains from taking natural capital seriously and the economic costs of not doing so. So I'd really encourage uh, everyone here on the call to look at the papers we've been doing on this subject and in alliance with the ONS, who've done some sterling work in developing the first pilot natural capital national accounts. Ian, I know you wanted to come back in. And of course, the other side of this is the Green Book and how yeah. far it's actually going to help steer towards uh, getting better choices of public policy going forward and better investments. Um, and the Green Book has been, the development of that has been one of our uh, pioneer projects like the Green National Accounts They'll be long left after we're uh, gone, but hopefully they'll make a real difference in practical terms. But but please come in on the on the on the treasury side and the economics of this. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I think uh, one of the legacies of the NCC is that we now have in the shape of the Green Book, which is the guidelines for um, assessing public spending. We have the rules to make sustainable uh, environmental economic decisions. We already had a green book that um, did a, a pretty good job of trying to value those flows. And there's been some improvement there. The biggest uh, um, uh, of which is if they just take those flows seriously, then we're going to see some quite uh, radical changes in decisions. But uh, talking of being radical, by far the most um, uh, world leading aspect now of the Green Book is its attitude towards natural capital stocks, mm. because you now have um, guidelines in the UK which say that you can't uh, run down stocks below the level which would um, uh, impinge against those future benefits. Uh, for um, uh, generations. So you need to have um, uh, care to ensure they don't decline. You need to assess that across different projects and you need to recognise that natural capital is uh, somewhat different to uh, machines, that sort of stuff. It has these uh, tipping points, these points at which if you push it too far, the whole system collapses. Now, that is really radical to have in a treasury guideline. There's nothing like it around uh, the world, um, which will, uh, if applied, will actually change this economy um, in uh, a fundamental way and also lead the world in terms of uh, public decision making. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Colin, you wanted to come back. Yes, I just wanted to add to that very important point that Ian was just making that this is as applicable to the private sector as it is the public sector. There is yeah. clearly great progress that is being made in terms of thinking about this in relation to public sector investment appraisal. We need to have the same thing happening in relation to the private sector and landowners. And we've attempted to do similar work on the accounting side in relation to corporate natural capital accounts. But there is a problem in terms of 
definition of profit, just as there is in terms of definition of national income, that unless one accounts properly for the extent to which private landowners and companies are depreciating their natural assets, we are seriously distorting the allocation of resources in the economy. So it has to be got right on both the public and the private side. Thanks, Colin. And 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 for the conference, um, um, Colin put together a paper on how to do corporate nat natural capital accounts, um, which is available. And um, I commend it to you. It's been fantastically helpful for the, for the committee going forward. And I also wanted to just pick up a point from what Ian said. This point about thresholds. This was brought to the committee by Georgina Mace. In the first committee, she very... Uh, uh, I think beautifully set out uh, a framework for uh, looking at renewable natural capital, looking at thresholds, looking at safe limits. And it was the marriage of that idea from science okay. We've lost our chance. Sorry about that. It's the second glitch for the day, but um, uh, back. Um, and I was just saying, um, uh, just referring to the marriage of the ideas from uh, Jordina's work, Jordina Mace's work on the thresholds and the safe limits and the economics, which Ian and Colin put together, which made our third natural capital report, which I um, uh, keep referring to, uh, have done this morning, as sort of foundational to what we subsequently done. Now, the next set of questions are really about national versus local. So we've focused on um, questions about the Green Book, what the government does at the Treasury level. We focused on uh, the issues of the national accounts and the corporate accounts. But a lot of um, the questions are about, well, what should be happening at the local level? What do individuals do? What does local leadership do? And uh, there's one question uh, pointing out that um, natural capital was first coined by E.F. Schumacher and uh, asking why we don't think about it in a more uh, bottom up way. Mm. Well, I guess the way the person put that question, uh, the question put that question to is Kathy. And then I'll bring in Chris, if I may, Chris Collins, um, because the whole point, as I understand it, of the ideas like the, the census, the citizen science, um, looking at your project uh, that you gave of the example of the Edenlow project. These are all examples of essentially why we put together the maps of each particular mm. bit to build up the picture for the overall uh, frame. So I think both that and the next question about um, local leadership and protecting um, and how they you bring that into protecting and enhancing natural capital are absolutely spot on. I think the, the way when you start to work out what which are the most important assets actually a lot of that does need to be done at the top down. It needs big data, big data sets in order to show across a landscape where are the really important parts to provide those assets. This, if you're, if you're just looking at a small area, you can sometimes miss the most critical part, for example, for water flow regulation or pollination. However, it absolutely has to be delivered from um, bottom up. We, it's not something that you can have a top down and then people actually on the ground are not the ones able to deliver it or to embrace that or to be shown what the alternative scenarios are on their landscape and what, what the benefits that will come from bringing about different land management. So I think there is a very strong bottom up part in here. And in terms of local government, Certainly, I think a lot of local governments are absolutely buying into this um, in the way that they're having them in their in their local plans. Natural capital is coming into local plans. And I know of at least eight uh, local governments now that have their own natural capital um, stocks and have mapped their, their local assets and have started to work this way through. But the key thing in here is having open source data and tools 
that enable the individual and the local councils to actually be able to do this work. And right now, we, we still don't have those. And just I want to just explore one dimension of this, because, you know, being uh, naturally um, uh, controversial on these things, my, my natural thought is, well, well, can you be too local? And the, the point that I quite like to make sure that we've got over in this conference is this point about net biodiversity gain versus net environmental gain, because in some sense, net biodiversity gain is incredibly local and uh, focused. Whereas I think, Cathy, you've uh, emphasised the importance of seeing any particular change in the context of the system to which it's embedded. Yeah. So I think that's right. So but a thriving wildlife is part of it. And that absolutely underpins what we're talking about here. But natural capital is talking about a much broader suite of, of of natural assets from the soils, which I'll hand over to Chris in a moment, the soils and the geology and the trees and the and their relationship across that landscape. And if we just focus on biodiversity, which is the thing that actually most of us think, well, I, yeah, that's what we that's what we w want to see on our landscape. We often miss then the key benefits because sometimes those benefits on the flows from them are not linked directly through to the to the biodiversity. Thanks. And I think that sort of addresses part of the question from uh, Professor Tom Oliver on my list. Um, but I want to just bring the soils into this frame, because, as I said um, at, at the beginning of the, the conference, you know, in our first committee, we neglected the marine, but we also neglected the soils. So we didn't have the expertise in the committee. And, you know, we're a small committee. We can't cover everything, but we had great benefit of having Chris, Chris Collins on board. And I wondered if you wanted to comment on that um, uh, point that Cathy's just been covering and more generally how we can incorporate soils into the frame. Can I find Chris at this point? I can see him on my screen, but... Um, he's muted. He's muted. Sorry, that first Chris. technical hitch of mine for the day. Um, <laughs> the mute button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think to pick up on where Mel left off, I think soils are sort of slightly ahead of marine in the fact we know how to do the census. It's been done in things like the Countryside Survey and also uh, the Cranfields nationwide soil assessment that's been done and they've yielded really fantastic results in knowing how soil carbon for example is um, spread across the country and the degradation in that soil carbon across the country so we know how to do it in a way in soil so the thing we really need to do is to get the metrics in place to do the uh, the do the monitoring and i think we know the metrics we just need a bit of uh, hand at the tiller from the government to sort of choose which ones to uh, appropriately allocate the different landscapes and what, what the different sort of envelope should be for each of those metrics within a different landscape. Uh, at the, and I think at the local level, uh, we know that there's already good work going on amongst farming communities within catchments to look at the soils and the role those soils play both in uh, natural flood management, there's lots of interest in that. And uh, obviously that again goes above just the individual, but requires that sort of catchment scale thinking in order to prevent flooding. But also we know that the water companies have worked with farmers to uh, put in things like barrier strips to prevent runoff of pesticides from farmers fields, thus sort of increasing the costs of water treatment. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely lots that can happen at both a sort of local and above that scale in order to improve our soils, but also have those sort of wider environmental benefits that we'd all like to see in net environmental gain. Um, Melanie wants to come back in, but before you do, Melanie, can I just push you on one further point, um, Chris, which is that um, you know, I, 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 I um, uh, made the point about that you taught me that soils contain uh, more carbon in the atmosphere um, and there's great enthusiasm and and uh, I, I could I could kind of hear it in uh, Barris Brown's comments earlier to think about how we can put carbon back in the soils um, given the agriculture bills out there as well and there's the elm schemes and so on and people talking about carbon pricing I mean from the science point of view how big is the opportunity to uh, address 
some of the dimensions of climate change by having a uh, a soil strategy that really treats it as crucial natural capital. Well, there's a, there's already a, an international movement called the Four per Mill uh, initiative, where the, the opportunity is there if we can increase our soils by 0.04% carbon per annum, we could offset all the anthropogenic emissions. I think most soil scientists, myself included, would say that's probably a great and ambitious goal, but unlikely to be achieved purely through soil management. Many of our soils aren't managed, um, but we know full well that carbon can be enhanced in our soils. We know in UK soils, our arable carbon has been going down since, certainly since the first records were taken in 78. So there's an opportunity there to restore the carbon and to do some offsetting. But I think the critical thing for me about soil carbon is if we can increase the carbon in our soils, it enhances all the other ecosystem services. So it improves our water uh, ability to capture water and filter that water. And it also increases our biodiversity within our soils. Those with higher carbon contents usually have a higher biological biomass. So yeah. there's lots of other secondary benefits from enhancing carbon in our soils beyond just the climatic ones. And I think that that bit about higher carbon, higher biodiversity in the soils, that's a, a kind of win-win opportunity if done right. Melanie, you had your hand up. Sorry to keep you waiting. Please come back in. You need to be off mute. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Dieter. I think there's some really nice points that I just want to pick up from what Chris said. Uh, if you improve the soil and the, the system upstream, that has benefit for the local coastal waters and downstream. Mm. I think also, if you want to think about local to national, the marine pioneer in North Devon rather exemplified that quite a lot of local uh, effort went into really, really getting a, to grips with what the natural capital was locally and the different national capital outcomes of flood protection, um, improved recreation and leisure experiences, in, improved health and well-being, going out then to the fisheries. Um, but then at a national level, there is the fact that, you know, a huge amount of carbon is locked up in the marine environment and that could also be enhanced. So, you know, improve things upstream, you improve things downstream. At a national level, we need to think about what can we do about carbon in the marine environment as well as on land but at a local level some of the people uh certainly in the southwest that i'm aware of and also i think in um hastings are looking at well how can they improve how can councils improve their carbon budgets their net zero targets by using the marine resource they have as well as the terrestrial resource so there's a lot of connection but it connects both from the local right up to the national and back again and in marine also obviously into international waters as well so yeah we have to flex between all of those things at different yeah, scales. I suspect we're going to need them all. Um, thank you very much for that. Now, we have a series of questions which um, people talk about spatial landscape planning. There's a question about how the natural environment has been shaped by human activity over millennia. And, and these questions go to the heart of uh, something which comes up quite frequently, which is, you know, we're focused on natural capital, um, but how does it relate to the other capitals? And in particular, what one might, might call historic capital, cultural capital, social capital. Um, and, and, and are there trade-offs between these things and, and can they be made? If I could uh, paraphrase some of the questions that have come up. Ian, it's obviously one to, for you to kick off on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dieter. Um, I think this, this uh, bridges uh, also uh, uh, back to the uh, local uh, issue as well. I do want to start off by saying there is a role, a very important role for national strategy. Yeah. Um, we have a limited amount of resource, far less than we should do, far less than the value of natural capital um, uh, deserves. And obviously we want that to change. But uh, whatever the state of resourcing is, uh, direction with regard to the fact that the natural environment is very varied and you get different uh, um, uh, consequences in different places is uh, uh, part of what uh, government should be doing here. However, uh, the local issue is absolutely crucial. And uh, your uh, comment, Dieter, about uh, the interaction with other 
capitals. Now, I, I think a lot of people would see me as a very hard-headed um, economist, but I've actually got a soft side as well. And, and that is that unless, <laughs> which you obviously are acquainted with, um, unless we actually harness the power of uh, local populations uh, 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 and culture, we are um, uh, enormously um, missing uh, the, the ability to get far greater uh, purchase in this field. There is, uh, I think, a, a huge latent willingness to actually do something positive about uh, the de degradation of the environment that all of us can see. And if we can bring this together and, for example, get local groups working with farmers so that actually together uh, they are um, uh, making the very most out of agricultural support, for example, then that's, um, uh, that's going to be a, a vital strategy for the future. I could go on, but I'll, I'll pass it. Thanks, pass it. Simon. Uh, I've never thought of you as hard-headed. <laughs> there we go. Um, Colin. Yes, yeah, just very, very quickly on this, I think I think it raises a very interesting and important point about thinking of, about different assets, in particular social assets and natural assets together. We tend to look at them independently, to value them independently, etc. But actually, if you look at the uh, natural, uh, national natural capital accounts, which amounted to in 2016, just less than a trillion pounds, which many of us feel is probably a considerable uh, underestimate. If you look at those accounts, you find that one third of that trillion pounds is associated with recreation. Mm. Okay, so it, it, its main contribution is to contribute to our well-being in terms of our mental, uh, physical health, but also to the extent to which we interact as communities and societies and families. And I think that that interrelationship is an absolutely critical feature of the work that we're doing and I hope the work that will continue to be done on natural capital going forward. Thanks, Colin. I can't resist bringing Cathy back on this point because you've done a lot of work on uh, mental health dimensions uh, of this uh, and the, uh, uh, this really quite close relationship. I mentioned earlier Ian's work about uh, the trees being near to people, but you've actually looked at green itself and uh, <laughs> just so two of yeah, those. I, I mean, the evidence base that's coming through on all of this, I mean, we tend to think green space recreation, but um, the evidence base sort of the medical work that's being done on this is shows that there's a huge difference between one sort of green space and another from the colour of the green, the shape of the trees, the density of the trees. And this again comes back to how do we bring this much closer to, to the individuals on these landscapes to make sure that when we have green space, we we absolutely maximise the potential benefits that we get from nature by really understanding the relationship, the properly understanding the relationship between physiological and psychological benefits that we get from from, from managing these urban landscapes. Thanks. Now, I, um, uh, I, I'm down to wind it up, but um, actually uh, it occurs to me, and I'm going to bounce our panel members on this, it occurs to me that what we should use the last minutes of our main conference for is to get each of our members to say what it is in the legacy they'd most like to see carried forward to the OEP and the Environment Bill. Uh, uh, and just to leave our audience with uh, a clear message as to what needs to be done. Um, and uh, I haven't pre-warned our uh, panel of this, so um, uh, uh, I apologise for that. But I think it's a much better way to leave the conference than for me to um, uh, try to sum it all up. So I'm going to start with Ian. Uh, and then I'm just going to quickly work through, and you have basically a minute each. Thank you very much, Peter, and um, I, I appreciate this. Um, I think I would start off by saying the, the, the framework and the guidelines are actually now there. They weren't there 10 years ago, and they actually are now. Um, we have a framework for understanding the relationship between the environment and uh, human well-being now and uh, into the future. And we have rules to bring that into 
uh, uh, government and um, uh, increasingly into uh, private decision making. What I want to see is those rules moved out of uh, you know the the August uh, domain of NCC publications and simply be applied. Um, I actually think that on its own um, would be an enormous step forward if we simply applied the rules that we have such that we take the resources we've got, we allocate them properly, we get people uh, involved uh, in uh, making this change, then we really can try and fulfil that uh, aim that the government stated back in 2011 to be the first generation to leave the natural environment in a better state for future generations. Thanks, Ian. Melanie. Thanks, Dieter. Um, I'd like to see the legacy be that we continue to bring natural capital thinking for marine systems into wider development of policy, of management, of regulation of the marine environment. We're about to go through a phase where marine energy, renewable energy, is going to be massively upticked. Uh, that's going to be in potentially in competition with fisheries and food production and also potentially with offshore aquaculture. And if we do it right, there are lots of win-win wins there. And if we do it wrong, we can just continue to, to just lose out economically, socially, um, and in all sorts of ways. So we need to bring that, that the fact that these are all interrelated into the regulation and the policy. And I think also, particularly thinking in terms of marine protection, that's very much on a feature-based system, a feature-based approach. And I think that should be much more focused around enhancing the broader natural capital assets rather than sort of the biodiversity focus that it currently has. So those are the things I'd like to see. Thank you, Melanie. Chris, off mute, please. You're still on mute, Chris. You need the Sorry, my button. mute button again. I must yeah, get to you. No problem. Go for it. OK, uh, so three things I'd like to see. Uh, as been mentioned, the commitment to net environmental gain rather than the very narrow bi net biodiversity gain. I think if we did that commitment, that would um, open up a whole set of things that we could improve, do to improve the environment. Uh, the OEP having genuine teeth and reporting to Parliament, that's obviously critical that we get that regulatory underpinning. We haven't had that with soils and that's what's led to them being degraded. And then the third thing is that the citizen science underpins the census that we've promoted and some elements of that should be embedded in the, natural, uh, the national curriculum. So, you know, certainly science curriculum now take on ecosystems where if they took on the natural capital approach, We'd certainly sort of be moving forward in the next generation. Thanks, Chris. Incredibly concise and dead right. Colin. I think what I'd like to see happening is that we move beyond the frameworks, the governance that we've put in place to investment, investment and expenditure. We need to now see a move towards investing in our natural capital, both by government and by the private sector. And I emphasize the fact that this is investment. We, we are in a crisis. We, we recognize the crisis in relation to global warming. We don't recognize it sufficiently in relation to our natural assets. And it is an investment. And the thing that the Natural Capital Committee has really demonstrated is the huge economic benefit to be had from that investment by all of us. Thank you, Colin. Cathy. Well, it's hard coming last because I agree with all of those points just made. I think I I'll mean make it for you. <laughs> all right, I shall I shall just make a couple more. I mean, one of the key ones I think is actually viewing nature as an infrastructure. Because right now we have our infrastructure, our roads, our hospitals and our houses, but nature always comes as as the sort of the after, the add-on. I think we need to bring this absolutely to the top of the table when we're having considerations about planning or anything else, that nature is a critical part of that infrastructure, not an add-on. So that'd be the first one. The second one is that I would 
you know, I, I every time I look at the data sets and look at what we have, it is absolutely critical that we get a handle on what we have in terms of the assets across the country, locally, regionally, and globally, in order to be able to measure trends and properly understand what is going on. Otherwise, every different group can argue one way or the other. And this is why I think we do have to have an environmental census in the same way as we have a population census. Every three to five years, go back and say, how are we doing? But the final point, and I think this very much feeds into the questions coming in, this has to be joint or shared ownership. It can't just be government. It can't just be academics or businesses. It absolutely has to involve everybody from NGOs, from the citizen scientists, right the way through to this, this global level. Because without that, without all of us sharing an ownership of the environment, it will always be seen as someone else's problem. Thank you, Cathy. Um, and that um, neatly brings us to the end of our main conference. We have the Science Symposium um, this afternoon and we have a, 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 a more technical accounting workshop later in the month. Um, but that's the, the end of the main uh, bit and um, uh, it's really the end of the uh, main activities of the Natural Capital Committee. Um, as I say, it's the end. Um, I hope that what we've done this morning is to give you a flavour of uh, what we've been doing. I hope in our final report, and I hope you'll read it, um, we have given uh, a proper account of ourselves and been accountable for what we've been up to. And I hope you'll see that we have uh, diligently tried our best to achieve the terms of reference we've been set. As I've said all the way along, I think it's it's very important to have committees with clear remits and when they've discharged the remits then it's for other committees and others to take on the work going forward and we have this a great segue from us through the environment bill to the targets uh, to the oep um, and of course the adaptation committee of the climate change committee and the climate change committee they're all there to take our legacy forward um, and i would conclude with the comment that um, when people ask me, well, you know, they're not really going to do it, are they? It's all words. Governments have promised this stuff in the past. You know, we haven't actually stopped increasing the parts per million in the atmosphere. You know, won't the degradation still go on? Doesn't that, doesn't your assessment show that we're not making much progress? Well, to which my reply is, you know, no, they will address it. And there are two ways of doing that. The first is to get on the front foot, lead and take the economic opportunities which are massive and have been highlighted by our committee and our reports to take those forward and get those opportunities and make people better off, increase well-being. The other is if you don't do it and you pursue an unsustainable strategy, which is what it will be, then it will not be sustained and we'll have to mess, clear up the mess at the end and we'll have to address these things coming from behind instead of in front. We've set out what you need to do to be ahead of the curve. We've set up what's needed to take the agenda forward. And our great hope is that this prize will be there for the next generation so they genuinely have a better natural environment than the one we've inherited. And speaking uh, uh, for myself and our population, you know, one we've mucked up terribly. We've done a lot of damage, as Zach Goldsmith highlighted, and um, enough is enough. And um, if we want economic prosperity, if we want a proper green recovery program, then this is the blueprint, if you like, or the outlines of a blueprint through the 25 year plan of how to do it. I'm proud. I'm sure we as a committee are deeply proud of having recommended that 25 year plan. And I hope to be around long enough to see it delivered so the next generation gets a better deal. So with that note, thank you very much for listening this morning. I hope it's been well, it's afternoon now. I hope it's been helpful and useful to you. Do come back with any comments, questions, engage with us. None of us are going to leave the scene just because the NCC is going to uh, come to an end. And do join us this afternoon for the Science Symposium when uh, um, Cathy is going to lead us through um, and we're going to have a series of presentations and some more Q&A. So let's stop at that point. Uh, uncharacteristically, it's two minutes late. 
and I've tried to keep everything to time throughout the last eight years. But thank you very much to the panel. Thank you much to the members. Thank you very much to our speakers. And thank you much, much to you, the audience, for participating and for your questions. So let's stop at that point and reassemble at two o'clock for the science uh, symposium. Thank you. <laughs>